Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Coleman. If you're hearing this, then you're on the public feed, which means you'll get episodes a week after they come out and you'll hear advertisements. You can get access to the subscriber feed by going to colemanhughes.org and becoming a supporter. This means you'll have access to episodes a week early, you'll never hear ads, and you'll get access to bonus Q&A episodes. You can also support me by liking and subscribing on YouTube and sharing the show with friends and family. As always, thank you so much for your support. My guest today is Jeffrey Maurer. Jeffrey has been a comedy writer, a speech writer, and a stand-up comic, and he's now a Substack writer. He was the senior writer for John Oliver's show Last Week Tonight, and his Substack is now called I Might Be Wrong. Uh, We talk about the rise of political comedy in America. We talk about how political polarization has changed American television. We talk about the problem of preachiness in comedy, both on the right and the left. We talk about the fine line between funny and offensive. We discuss the mechanics of joke writing. We talk about the culture of the comedy cellar, which is my favorite comedy club. We discuss the importance of laughter. We talk about how wokeness hurts the Democratic Party. We discuss the cancellation of Winston Marshall, formerly of the band Mumford & Sons. We talk about how Democrats could win in the midterms. We talk about gender pronouns, audience capture, and much more. So without further ado, Jeffrey Maurer. Jeffrey, thanks so much for coming on my show. Yeah, thanks very much for having me. Uh, Can you give my audience a sense of who you are? I know you used to be the senior writer for, for John Oliver's show. Um, but like, you know, start from the beginning. How did you get into comedy and comedy writing? And then how did you come to be a person with opinions about politics and, and a sub stack? Oh, my God, you made it like a, a deep existential question, <laughs> far beyond a biographical yeah. question. Who who am I? I? I don't know. The answer is I don't know. But uh, let's start with the nuts and bolts. So um, in my mid 20s, I, uh, I had re- recently got back from the Peace Corps and I was looking for a job. I didn't have one yet. And I thought, well, if you don't, st- I'd always loved stand up. And I thought, if you don't start doing stand up when you're 25 and unemployed, then when the hell are you going to start doing stand up? So I started doing stand up and I had no plan beyond uh, let me go to an open mic and see if I can not embarrass myself. I failed at that plan. I bombed so hard my first time out. Um, but luckily, I did a second show and that one went a little better. And then it just kind of kept going. Um, I eventually got a job. I, uh, was a speechwriter for the Environmental Protection Agency for almost nine years. So that was that was my uh, life for about nine years. Uh, I was a speechwriter during the day and a stand-up comic at night. And then eventually, you know, one thing leads to another. You kind of, you know, you get spotted in a club and somebody says, hey, submit a packet to this thing. And then that leads to submitting a packet to the next thing. And eventually that led me to submitting a packet for last week tonight with John Oliver when he started that show and I got hired. And then I was there for six years and then it became time to go. So now I write a sub stack called I Might Be Wrong. And I'm thrilled that I was able to get the plug for the sub stack in there in the first like two minutes. That's professional podcasting, in my opinion. <laughs> but yeah, so that's the that's like the basic career path. Mm-hmm. Uh, but how I became interested in politics, I don't know. I mean, you start out as like a very annoying teenager. I was because I grew up in a pretty conservative area, the Tidewater area of Virginia. So I was a really obnoxious, like lefty teenager, just like everything's so corporate. Everyone's all racist. And everything's corporate and bad. And then you grow up a little bit. And I'm, I'm still on the left side of the political spectrum, but I try to purge that, you know, petulant, self-righteous uh, 16 year old from me, at least a little bit. Um, and I don't know. It's just 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 my area of interest. I, I basically know three things in my life, politics, comedy and soccer. That's it. Everything else, don't ask me about them because I don't know. Yeah, so I've um, I first encountered your your article about Clapter uh, mm-hmm. before uh, I knew who you were on Persuasion, and I thought that was a really interesting concept. And I guess my background for this purpose is that, um, you know, I. Uh, I've done stand-up comedy, you know, maybe four oh, you or have. five times. Oh, you have? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've done Oh, I didn't mics. know that. Yeah, okay. I've done a few open mics, not seriously, not at, not in any kind of sustained way. 
Mm-hmm. But right around the time that I got into writing long essays for Quillette, I was also sort of obsessively going through a phase of working on jokes and um, doing doing open mics. <coughs> and um, in the in the meantime, I'm I'm you know a big fan of comedy, and I go to the Comedy Cellar all the time. Oh, okay. And um, I, I happen to be you know, really good friends with the owner there. So I'm, I just end up hanging out there all the time, seeing shows, know that. sometimes hanging out with comics and do they let you, do they let you uh, to the table upstairs? Do they let you sit at the comics table? I've, I've been at the, I've had the honor of sitting at the okay, comics then. table maybe twice in, okay, in my then. life, which is, is, it's a very special feeling. <laughs> they don't, they don't, they don't often let uh non-comics sit at the comics table. It's usually, it's, they don't. SD can sit there because she yes. owns the place. And uh, <laughs> I did once, I, one time I saw Gloria Steinem there <laughs> and was, she was there with Amy Schumer. And mm-hmm. that was one of those nights when I was like, oh, this t- too cool for my blood. And I just kind of slunk in the corner and didn't, <laughs> didn't say anything to anybody. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a great room. I, I People should go to the comedy cellar if you want to see comedy like as it should be done stand-up comedy as it should be done the comedy cellar is great it's one of the few landmarks in new york Mm. that like still actually is the thing that it claims to be like grimaldi's Mm. is not you know a a pizza place anymore it's a tourist attraction now Mm -hmm. the comedy cellar is still a working functioning comedy club yeah it's it's amazing it's really my favorite place in the city um You've been you've been, I think, critical of the culture of writers rooms at political comedy shows like the one you used to work at. And you talked a lot about the rise in political comedy, right? Like political comedy used to not be a thing. And then, you know, in in my lifetime, it's there's been an explosion of shows that mix comedy and serious or sort of pseudo serious political arguments mm-hmm. um, that alternate between pure laughs and preachiness in a way that <laughs> audiences really relate to. Yeah. And I, I'm, uh, I'm glad that you think uh, pure laughs is still part of the mix. I'm flattered that, <laughs> that you're still including mm-hmm. that. A lot of people would say that part has uh, faded away entirely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But uh, I guess I just want to, start by talking about that trend like you know you've worked in you've been in the writer's room for for these john oliver um for for the john oliver show at least was there a cognitive dissonance for you at that time of not totally loving what you were doing or feeling that the preachiness was not um serving the show or or at that time were you totally into what you were doing uh yeah it's uh that's a that's a great question and a tough one to answer so you're right that I've written about, well, Clapter, you know, sort of message replacing comedy. And uh, I, I don't think I've really been, I, I'm not sure if I've been critical of the writer's rooms. I've been critical of, you know, the environment generally, which includes, you know, Twitter and just any pressure you could imagine that a comedy writer might feel. And to give the very, very, very brief history of this genre, for decades, the model was the Johnny Carson model where you talked about the news and it was sort of the compendium piece to the local news because he came on right after the local news. It's like you get the local news and then you get Johnny Carson's take on the news. Uh, So it was a lighthearted take, but you didn't know Johnny's political opinion. Nobody ever really knew where Johnny Carson stood politically. I think to this day, I don't know how I voted. That was the model forever. And when Letterman came along and then Leno and Conan, they all stuck to that model. But then in the late 90s, John Stewart did something which was really innovative at the time. And, you know, it's like there are other political comics. Bill Maher was around at that point. But John Stewart started giving his actual opinion on The Daily Show. And it was kind of revelatory because it was an added element. You know, we get the comedy and then we actually we're also getting commentary. You know, it's like an op ed column or whatever. So that became a new thing. And then the new thing really pro- proliferated when you got eventually Colbert. And then last week tonight came around. And, you know, now there are many shows. It's like, you know, Colbert, which replaced Letterman. Now that's a political show. Seth Meyers has become political. You got full frontal with Sam B. And then, you know, many who have, you know, kind of come and gone. It's a whole genre now. It's a thing. And you're right that I, I do sometimes feel, and again, this is more about like comedy generally than late night shows specifically, that, yeah, sometimes the message is replacing the laughter. 
I always thought it last week tonight we were cooking with two ingredients, right? You got the the commentary and you got the humor. And you'd use those two ingredients in different amounts. Um, but it does seem like sometimes now the it's, you know, very little humor and all message. And then there's also the question of like, what is the quality of the commentary? <laughs> all commentary is not equal. Some of it's really insightful and then some of it's pretty trite. Um, it does feel sometimes like the commentary is totally crowding out the humor in a couple cases. And I'll tell you why that happens is because writing a joke is really hard. That's really hard. Um, but just having an opinion on something is super easy. And we don't only really see this in late night. You know, we see this in the world of, you know, I've got a sub stack. Everyone's got a sub stack. You know, you do a lot of writing. Uh, it's easy to have an opinion. There's sort of a proliferation of opinions. And yeah, I do think those are kind of starting to crowd out uh, the comedy sometimes. I, I, the, the way I like it is I like a balance. I like a balance. And I also like comedy that's just comedy. I mean, I'm a huge Conan fan. I love Conan. I love just how silly it was. But also being a political person, I would watch Conan and then I would also watch Jon Stewart on The Daily Show. How much of that preachiness, like, did it bother me? You know, I have to admit that I was responsible for a lot of it. You know, some of it is you're, you kind of grow up. Um, you sort of thing you, you, as you as you're more involved in that world and you feel honestly like less insecure about losing your job when that stuff starts to happen then you do start to take a step back and think you know okay what are we doing here is this any good and it's always a challenge it's always a push and pull i think the challenges we had at last week tonight were i would imagine similar to the challenges that happen at any media organization whether it's cnn or the new york times or just any place that is putting out content related to politics you got questions about, are we being honest here? Are we being balanced here? Is this interesting? Is this good? Is this insightful? And I think sometimes we did pretty well. And I think sometimes we totally shit the bed. It was a real mixed bag, as it is at probably every organization in the world. And, you know, all your listeners, they, they probably have opinions about these shows. Either they're, you know, diehard fans or they uh, have been sickened by them long ago and never watch. Um, and... I'll tell you, as somebody who was on the inside, I don't have any simple answer for you to the question of, are these shows good or bad? Like, it's mixed. It's a mixed bag. <laughs> there are people doing good stuff, and there are people doing shit. That's my opinion. It occurs to me that the change from the Johnny Carson model to the modern model, um, it definitely tracks a broader change in, in polarization in the country, like in you know, 1985, yeah. 1990. You have a lot of households in America where, you know, dad's a Republican, mom's a Democrat or vice versa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not viewed as weird. You know, it's uh, it's totally normal just to have a household of mixed political affiliation. Yeah. When you turn on the TV, you want to see a show. It makes sense to, to create a show that is, you know, less political. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, we have this extreme polarization and clustering and self-sorting by politics mm -hmm. where like it's uh, a, a lot of people they just don't even know a single person of the other party not by any concerted choice but just by where you live and how people sort by by job and and by geography by subculture yeah um and so people are getting married to people that agree with them about everything. Um, relationships are ending based on political differences at a much higher degree than they used to. And it makes sense that there would be a proliferation of TV shows that cater to smaller markets with more specific, absolutely narrow political values. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you were to ask, okay, why is this happening now? Probably one of the big parts of the answer is, it's because of this splintering of media. You know, Johnny Carson was back during the days of the monoculture, as they say. You know, he had three TV networks. You can watch ABC, NBC, or CBS, or you can go fuck yourself. You know, those are your options. So if you're Johnny Carson, you can't, you can't <laughs> do a show that alienates a big portion of the country. You have to get a gigantic slice of that pie. But then once things start breaking into cable networks and, you know, now... The internet, we're seeing this in print media now with, uh, you know, Substack kind of disrupting, sorry to use that word, but <laughs> disrupting, you know, Substack the New York Times. And, 
uh, <laughs> <laughs> disrupting, disrupting. Though people are also sometimes offended by the very word Substack. Uh, but yeah, disrupting. It's just such a dumb uh, tech buzzword. But the point is, you know, the old old ways of doing things are breaking down. So you no longer have to get a uh, very big slice of the pie, mm. you can get a you can get a really narrow slice of the pie. You know, as if your audience is deep but not wide, that's mm. fine these days. So you can have a uh, you know one cable news network, MSNBC. That's like we're the we're the liberal network. You want the true blue talking points? You come to us. And then you've got Fox News, and they go, we give you the red talking points. And now mm. Fox News is breaking. You know, uh, One America News and Newsmax is like, well, but what if you? <laughs> <laughs> but what if you got some really interesting opinions? Then where do you go? You go to mm -hmm. us. So yeah, it's largely a result of uh, of that splintering, I think. And it does make me worry because another thing I write about is, you know, so I'm 41. I would say the big political event of my lifetime would be, in my opinion, watching the Republican Party slowly lose its mind. Uh, you know, think about it. I was 14 in 1994 when Newt Gingrich uh, became Speaker of the House. That is, for many people, that's an inflection point in the history of the Repo Republican Party. So that's also the point when I'm, I'm becoming roughly aware of what the hell's going on in the world. And I feel like I've slowly watched them get weirder and weirder and weirder to the point where, you know, and then eventually they nominate Trump. And at this moment, there's a notable, you know, anti-vax contingency in the Republican Party. You've got QAnon people inside the tent and you go, whoo, that is rough stuff what happened and my very simple explanation for what happened was the media ecosystem fox news uh am radio they kind of created this very partisan kind of fact-free media zone that has rotted the republican brain and i worry very much about that happening on the left i worry about that happening on the left because you know now <laughs> not now you're talking about me losing my home and there are certainly like signs of worry. And I and I, I do worry that the media ecosystem is getting so because, like you said, you can go long periods of time without encountering anybody with a different opinion. So that encourages groupthink. that encourages, uh, you know, just going along to get along. And uh, and I think that's I think that's, you know, really not healthy. And I do worry about it sometimes. Yeah. And this notion of clapter, I thought was really good. And it's something I've seen a lot. Um, having watched a lot of comedy, I also used to watch a lot of comedy at Columbia. Uh, okay. And they had, there's, you know, there's comedy clubs and comedy groups that do basically comedy by Columbia students for Columbia students. Highly progressive. I, okay. I did uh, not know that. That's <laughs> sure. I yeah. think of, <laughs> I think of acapella groups when I think of uh, Ivy League entertainment. Yes. <laughs> I'm not sure that comedy is much better than the acapella. But yeah. you know, I, I have thought of this. What a, what a damning statement, by the way. Arguably not better than the acapella groups. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> you just cut their throats. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is the, the clapter, which is, you know, the, the sort of instead of getting people to have sort of like a deep belly involuntary laugh like yeah. that really good kind of laugh where you you can't help yourself you can't help a laugh right even mm -hmm. if you think what was said was like so, somehow wrong you just cannot help yourself but you're just di your diaphragm is moving without your say so those are the mm -hmm. really the deepest kinds of laughs yeah. that comics want to be getting there's this other thing you call clapter which is and, and you'll see this in a lot of a lot, a, lot, a lot of comics acts, which is they'll yeah. say something praiseworthy, something mm -hmm. they'll say something uh, that's not strictly speaking funny, but that yeah. enough people <laughs> in the audience agree with yeah. that you'll get lots of claps and woos, but yeah. very few laughs. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. And some, sometimes it's almost, uh, it's like you're bullying the audience into responding to it. If you say something like, like you know, teachers should be paid more. It's like, oh, fuck it fine I, yeah. okay it's like i don't it's like, i don't, I don't want to look like an asshole not clapping at that exactly what, what do i think teachers should be paid less <laughs> yeah right right do That's i hate not babies what, yeah right. yeah exactly yeah. so so yes people do respond but uh that is absolutely not necessarily the same as having a good time and uh and yeah it's a it's a it's a cheap way to do things and i didn't invent the term clapter by the way clapter is a that's a comedy term that's out there oh, I, I didn't realize that. I never, no no, I no i didn't invent it. well it's it's yeah stand up say it 
because we needed, you know, ask John McWhorter, like how do words develop? Words develop when you have a need for them. There became a need <laughs> to describe mm -hmm. this thing where people, yeah, like in stand up specifically, but it can apply to any type of comedy. Yeah. You have to get a response when you're doing stand up, right? Mm -hmm. You have to get a response. To, I mean, you've, I'm glad you've done a few open mics. That silence, it burns, it oh, burns, yeah. and you can, you can feel it right. eating at your skin. So you have to get some response. Right. But laughter is hard to come by. So if you can't do laughter, then yes, just say something that everyone agrees with. Right. And then at least you don't have silence. Clapter, getting clapter doesn't feel at all like bombing. And I think it's, it's hard to relate. I mean, people can imagine the humiliation, but the humiliation of just <laughs> thinking a joke is hilarious and going up there and saying it and the punchline just is crickets. Yeah. It's mortifying. So, so can, can I can I ask these five open mics? How did they go? You know, actually, I didn't bomb ever. Congrats. I, I, I didn't kill either. OK, but I I, I, I did solidly. But no, OK, not total silence. I, I think yeah, in no. early shows, not total silence counts as not bombing any reaction whatsoever yeah yeah other than clapping is uh, yeah yeah is bombing now you didn't make the giant mistake that a lot of people do and invite 30 friends to your first show did you no 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 okay okay <laughs> that's because you're a smart guy i see that sometimes at open mics people mm -hmm. oh it's it's way too much investment thankfully when i was bombing in my early days i was bombing uh in front of nobody i knew so uh, right. at least i didn't have to like explain myself afterwards right yeah but the, i think that the, the temptation to go for clapter is just it, it uh especially if your audience is ideologically homogenous yeah like say you're a, a comic doing a show on a college campus not a professional co comic or or maybe a professional comic it's like you kind of know the students will clap if you say anything progressive Mm -hmm. And if you're an up and coming comic, the temptation to mistake that for comedy mm -hmm. or to mistake that for being really well liked mm -hmm. is um, it, it's it, it, I imagine it could be very tough for people who who maybe don't think about this the same way to distinguish that from actually making people laugh. It's like, oh, well, they were applauding me the whole time. Maybe yeah. I'm really good at this comedy thing. And, and the problem with that is the second you go to an ideologically mixed audience uh -huh. like at the comedy yeah. cellar or whatever you have tourists, you have New Yorkers, you have, mm -hmm. you know, all kinds of people, or God forbid you go somewhere, you, you do what every stand up comic has to do and tour the country and mm -hmm. play for rural audiences and, and so yep. forth. All the stuff that got one audience to clap for is you're, you're going to lose another audience on. And yeah. that's where it becomes difficult because had you been really trying to be funny from the start, Funny mm -hmm. is usually funny to to a broader range of of, of audiences, mm -hmm. but the clapter is really politically specific. Yeah, yeah. I'll, you know, I never had too many political jokes in my stand up act, and people are often surprised by that because you know it's it's one of my main areas of interest. It's what I studied in school. It's where I've worked for basically my entire adult life. I I had very few political jokes. And the, the main reason for that is because because I was, you know, going uh, touring some not I was never like a road dog, but I'd get out of, you know, the Northeast Corridor. And but even within the Northeast Corridor, the minute you start talking about politics, half the audience goes, you know what, this is not a thing I'm interested in. It's, it's just not something I follow. I don't really know what you're talking about. So you've already lost half the audience. The remaining half, if your joke has you know, any edge to it whatsoever. If it was anything beyond, you know, back in the day, you could do like, oh, George W. Bush isn't very smart. And people, you know, even Republicans would concede, all right, he's not that smart. But but any any edge beyond that, any commentary beyond that, anything where your um, actual viewpoint is known, then you're going to lose half of the half. So now you're down to talking to one quarter of the audience. So it generally doesn't work. But, and this is an important but, yeah, then sometimes you'll get into rooms, you'll get into these really progressive rooms in Brooklyn, you know, it's, it's just some Brooklyn bar and everybody's 25 and they have an ironic mustache. And yeah, you can you can just say something that is something they agree with and get that clap their response. And then, you know, I worried about this on last week tonight. And it's a trap I admit I fell into sometimes I would kind of I get kind of self righteous and think, you know, what I'm saying is important. What I'm doing is important here. And I would, it's like, I wanted to do comedy, you know, 
It wasn't just, hey, what's the deal with soup? Have you seen how many flavors they have? It's like I wanted to do something that was a little sharper than that. Mm -hmm. But if you do it wrong, then it does just become, hey, here are six talking points I read earlier today on the Daily Coast. And I want you to clap every each time, all six times when I say them, I want you to clap. And I'm going to count that as a segment. That is that is the form done wrong, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, so. I don't want to give anyone the impression that I'm I only object to progressive preachiness. Sure. I think w- what is true of me is that when I see a, a stand up or anything comedy related, I, I generally prefer it to be pure comedy. So, mm-hmm. for instance, when I saw Dave Chappelle's latest special, where the majority of the special is about one topic trans and within that um the ratio of pure jokes to actual points that dave Chappelle thinks are serious and deep observations Mm -hmm. was like i don't know it felt like one to one yeah or maybe two to one even even three to one and that was a real turnoff for me even when i agreed with him on certain specific points I mm-hmm. just felt like this is not what I'm coming to a comedy special for is your your commentary. And I think the truth is most comics aren't that good mm-hmm. at commentary, at serious commentary, e- even Chappelle or or at minimum, they're not nearly as good as they are at jokes. Right? Yeah. So the, the quality of the show goes from here when they're making jokes to here mm-hmm. when they're making commentary and it's noticeable. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, no, that's why the people who can actually do it are, you know, legendary. You're, mm-hmm. You know, Mort Sauls and George Carlin's is like, right. that's why we remember them, because they could actually do that. But yeah, I'm and, and for what it's worth, like, it's hard for me to be objective about Dave Chappelle, because he was huge to me back in the day. One of the funniest mm-hmm. shows I've ever seen, well, I saw Dave Chappelle when I was in college, and it was I mean, he was an absolute murderer back then and in, in, you know, comedy terms. Oh, of course, of course. <laughs> Didn't literally come, but he, it was so funny. Killing them softly is to this day one of my favorite specials. So yeah, that, funny. That was a special that got me into stand-up comedy oh, at all. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's one of the huge ones. It's one of the huge ones. And uh, yeah, so he's, he's one of the on, the, on the very short list, you know, of like people who made me think, I want to do that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, the, the last special, you know, there are many, many, many opinions about it. But one thing I think most people agree on is like, not as funniest, not as funniest. <laughs> and that's certainly mm-hmm. where I fall. Like, eh, not as funniest. I, I certainly didn't enjoy watching it. Yeah. I mean, half as much as killing me softly. That one was way funnier. Right. But but I think it was it was not funny for the same general reason that Nanette was not funny, which is that <laughs> too much of it were not too much of it was not composed of jokes. It was composed yeah. of, of, of points that the comic thought were very serious and interesting to them. But mm-hmm. again, I, I, you know, most of the audience in both cases, most of your audience are going to find your points to be shallow. If you're mm-hmm. a, a, a comedian who spent you know 30 40 years figuring out how to be super funny but not you haven't really spent 40 years figuring out how to make good arguments that that are controversial enough to be meaningful but uh not so controversial that you lose the majority of people you're talking to like like that that's a, a hard skill too so you know, I, I don't know. And, and I'm not really sure if I can defend this sort of purist approach to comedy that you should only make jokes. And I'm not even sure that's what I believe. You know, I think yeah. if you're going to make a serious point, it, you, you should be really sure that it's profound enough to justify the departure from comedy. Mm-hmm. And I mm-hmm. think people probably don't do that as, as much as they should. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. If you can, hey, if you if you can do something that is, you know, an interesting comment, an interesting statement. And it's maybe a little funny, but not very funny. Like, that's a thing, too. Some people are going to be very into that. I mean, definitely. I mean, when I was at last week tonight and now that I'm writing my Substack, there are definitely pieces like they're not the funniest things I've ever written. 
Mm-hmm. But like, I still think they're good because I, th- I still think there's something there. Like I said, you're kind of cooking with two ingredients. You got the commentary and you got the comedy. Mm-hmm. If you're using, yeah, if it's, if the commentary is less interesting, well, then it better be funny. And if the commentary is pretty interesting, then you can dial the comedy down a little right. bit. And yeah, I agree that the real problem comes when you're kind of doing neither, right? Right. Maybe the commentary is shit. And then, it, and then those are coming in place of the jokes. Mm-hmm. Then it does become a case of, yeah, why am I watching this? And it also a little bit punctures your image of the comic as the master of, of sort of everything. Right. Because mm-hmm. you see them say something dumb <laughs> and, and not funny, dumb, just kind of dumb, dumb. Yeah, and then yeah. it punctures the the air of invincibility that is kind of or, or whatever air of their whatever persona they're going for. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, he's just kind of another dumb. Just he's just like another normal person. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's funny. It's a, bit of, it's a bit of a meet your heroes moment. Yeah, it is. Which is, um, you know, I and I always remember the arguments that comics make really seriously that strike me as as really bad arguments. So. For instance, I remember in, in Nanette, uh, I, I forget what, what her name, uh, Hannah Gatsby. Hannah Gatsby. Or yeah. yeah. She made it's not argument. Nanette. It's confusing. Her name is Hannah Gatsby. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. She made the argument that, you know, Harvey Weinstein type behavior. Uh, she, she basically talked about Harvey Weinstein and said, well, this is the norm for men. And I was like, mm-hmm. what are you talking? Yeah. This is precisely <laughs> news because of how abnormal his behavior is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And like that, that's the moment she lost me mm-hmm. because it was, it was so clearly a point that didn't like, she, she wasn't engaging with the counterpoint. She wasn't, you know, this is just something that compelled her emotionally. She wanted to say it and right. to a portion of the audience, they're just, they're just going to be like, they're just going to be lapping it up. And in the, in the Dave Chappelle case, he, he made an argument that women view trans people like black people view blackface, which I think mm-hmm. is, is factually not true. I mean, like if I saw you yeah. walking down the street with clear blackface makeup, I think every black mm-hmm. person would be like, what, what is wrong with that guy? Whereas most <laughs> fair, not certainly, <laughs> certainly not all women see every trans person and say, what the hell is wrong with that person? Yeah. Right? A good portion will view it as a civil rights issues. Whereas no black people will view someone wearing blackface as like a civil rights identity, you know. So right, those you, kind you, of if, things. If, if you're people. trans, one would one would hope you have a, a, at least a chance, and one would hope you can actually do this of going about your day and just going about your day the way anyone right. would. You're right. If if I uh, <laughs> put on blackface, I think the odds of me getting through my day <laughs> would be quite low. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, right for justifiable reasons. I I. I don't frequently do that. So I want to talk a little bit about the challenge of being funny without being offensive or, or the notion Mm -hmm. of offense in, Mm -hmm. in comedy, because I think there's a, a misimpression that people who don't know how the sausage is made uh, have, which is, you know, I guess two things. One is that, you don't really know where the line is and until you cross it Mm -hmm. and dial back, right? Like you don't know what people are going to find too offensive until you bump up against the edge of it and sort of roll it back. Yeah. And there's also just uh, a really fine line between funny and offensive. There's like the, the, the classic Louis joke where he says the word, Jew is either a racial slur or totally okay. (laughs) The correct word. Yeah. Just depending on how you pronounce it. Yeah. And that's true of, I mean, that's true of phrases. That's true of, of ideas, like how you present something. There's very subtle differences that can be the difference between a hilarious joke and an an offensive joke. Mm -hmm. And then there's the final point, which a lot of people don't know. And I'm curious if you would agree with this, which is that in most cases, comics do not know which jokes are going to be funny until they utter them for the first time in front of an audience. That is it's a thousand percent a true. Shoot. That is a thousand yeah. percent true. That is the most true thing in the world. Yeah. And you. And, it, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was say, it's like it's like true of music, too. Right? Like we, we all know what the hits are in retrospect, but 
Mm-hmm. There are these great stories of like Al Green did not think Let's Stay Together was going to be a hit. He was like, I right. don't know. This song kind of sounds, I feel like it's not my best. And can you, it, it, and Drake didn't know God's plan was going to be a hit. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Ra- and in uh, retrospect, you're like, ra- everyone knows it's a hit. Radiohead's uh, Creep by Radiohead was released twice. It was released yeah. by a single. It did absolutely nothing. Then it was released again on the album and became a huge hit. Right. So, and, yeah, and jokes are like that. They are absolutely like that. And I, I have honestly, I stunned myself, <laughs> you know, through the course of my comedy career, how I didn't really get much better at that. I got a little better at guessing. You know, mm-hmm. there are some things you can kind of key in on, but I never got good at guessing literally the only way to do it is to tell it in front of an audience. That's one of the reasons when you see a TV show, those audiences are so amped up and it's a good goddamn thing because they will laugh at anything and they have to, because all those jokes are, you know, more or less, I mean, you had rehearsal, but more or less first run. Mm. Yeah. You never figure it out. You never get a good, or at least a a completely accurate horse sense for what's going to work and what's not. You absolutely have jokes where you sort of like you described, you're thinking like, oh, this is killer. Oh, I I finally done it. You know, this is, this is my moment of inspiration. This is like when Paul McCartney woke up with yesterday in my head. This, this is that. And then you go and you do it at a show and the audience just goes, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. And you throw it away and you never use it again. Again. Um, That happens all the time. And it does affect like how edgy you can be because you're right. Being taboo, like that's funny. That's one of the breaking taboos is one of the funniest things you can do Mm -hmm. if you do it right. And if you go to a comedy club, you'll see this. One of the funniest things that happen is can happen is that a comic will, will go there and talk about things that don't normally talk about. Mm-hmm. A big part of the fuel in the laughter bonfire at a comedy club, it's very often very proper, very subdued women in their 50s and 60s laughing really fucking hard at dirty sex stuff Mm -hmm. because their life just doesn't involve them talking about things in that way and then the comic gets on stage and talks about it and then they just it's like liberating they're like losing their shit yeah because somebody's breaking that taboo that's a real (laughs) thing you know then there's the cheap way to do it much like there's a cheap way to do clapter like you can just get up and think you know list off the dirtiest things you can think of and that's not funny because you're cheating but yeah breaking taboos is a big thing and when somebody does it properly it's really, really funny. And that is one of the reasons that this, you know, chilling atmosphere that is kind of descending over comedy or has descended over comedy, however you want to look at it. That's why it, it makes that proposition a lot riskier because you don't know where the line is. You don't know where the line is. There's this gigantic fuzzy range of where the line might be. And that range exists not only for the comic, but also for the audience, because the audience, if the comic starts tiptoeing into areas where the audience isn't sure if they should be going. Then the audience is going to clam up and they're, it's sort of the opposite of like, hey, give it up for teachers thing. It's sort of like, oh, I don't even know. I don't even know if you should be talking about this. So we're just, no, please move on to something else. Mm-hmm. It makes it so the range of stuff you can talk about is just, it's just a lot more narrow than it used to be. And therefore the taboo breaking is a lot less and it, it leads to just kind of safe comedy. I mean, this is the, the article you're referring to on my Substack stack is, um, called how the religious left is turning comedy into Christian rock. And I do feel that it's kind of the same thing. Because again, I'm from a religious area and a lot of people where I grew up, like they're into Christian rock. And the promise of Christian rock is that it's super safe. And that's becoming, in some cases, the promise of comedy as well. It's super safe. We're not going to go outside these bounds. We're not going to break any taboos or challenge anything. And personally, I think you're, you know, taking a lot of stuff that's potentially funny off the table. So my my sense, though, is that that's not actually happening yet because people, you know, like so long as there's any semblance of freedom, the comics, Mm -hmm. and there's always going to be a big demand for comics who break those taboos because as you, as you pointed out, breaking taboos is a constitutive element of comedy, right? It's Mm -hmm. not like breaking taboos is sometimes happens to be funny. Yeah. It's like, you know, part of the definition of funny or one of the core elements of funny yeah. is precisely breaking taboos. It's it's what salt is to cooking. You kind of got to right. have it. Yeah. Right. So, and I think, you know, you know, if, if Netflix doesn't want to give Andrew Schultz a deal or something, he, he, he'll get huge on YouTube. So, so far as there isn't some, isn't a blanket censorship across the board. Yeah. People right. are just going to pop up on 
uh, on other platforms because there's going to be a hunger. It's going to create a hunger for that kind of taboo breaking comedy that will pop up. And in my experience at places like the comedy cellar where, and I, this is increasingly the norm for comedy clubs where they take your phone at the door and put it in a, in a sealed bag. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. comics really have no reason to fear that if they, if they do fuck up, if they do cross a line and one show, it's not going to ruin their careers. They're not going to get canceled for it. Yeah. Um, The jokes I think are just as taboo breaking as they ever were. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you, I think you're making a great advertisement for the comedy seller Mm. because for people who, you know, don't live in New York and aren't, um, you know, don't know this world closely, by the way, the comedy seller for people who don't know, that's the room you saw at the beginning of Louie. When Louis, the show Louis on FX, mm-hmm. when he would get off the subway and get the slice of pizza and go into a comedy club, he's going into the comedy cellar. Yeah. And it very much has that uh, that vibe in New York of it is still the rules are a little different in the comedy cellar than they are in other other parts of the world. I mean, there are lots of good clubs, but um, in that, yeah, the, the taboo breaking is still very much part of what's on the menu there. Um, the phone thing, by the way, is it's it's partly because, yeah, I mean, somebody will try to cancel you for anything and it's silly, but it's also because comics are like working, they're working material out. So they don't want somebody tape. And this is like a totally reasonable concern. They don't want somebody taping a half written bit and then posting it on the Internet and going, wow, this famous person isn't really funny. It's like, well, yeah, this is because the bit's not done yet. When, yeah. when you see them do it on HBO, it'll be finished. Right. Um, but I do think you make a really good point about, you know, these kind of currents that, you know, I talk about sometimes we've been talking about here, other people, I'm far from the only person to notice that it does seem to be getting a little bit puritanical sometimes Mm -hmm. in comedy. Yeah. Those are currents that exist, but they're, you know, they don't dominate every space and they don't dominate the comedy cellar and they don't dominate other spaces. And you're right that there's a thirst for taboo breaking sometimes and, you know, stuff that doesn't necessarily play by the rules if you're trying to figure out why Joe Rogan is so enormous, certainly part of the answer is he doesn't give a fuck about any of those tab- taboos. And, you know, people find that refreshing. That's one of the yeah. reasons he's been able to build an audience. And, Bill and Burr, I try Andrew Schultz, a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. I, I try to, you know, on on my sub stack, I try to, you know, play by the rules that I think are fair. I, you know, I obviously have to stand behind whatever I write. But, uh, you know, there are some... <laughs> Sometimes I trust my audience to just know, like, it's a joke. You'll, you know, mm-hmm. I, I think you can, in 99% of cases, you can trust people to be adults and know when a joke is a joke. Right. I mean, so one of the things that I think perpetually insulates comedy from censorship mm-hmm. is that laughter is far more honest and tamper proof than praise for your argument, right? If you make an argument that deep down I don't agree with, Mm -hmm. but I feel enormous pressure to agree with, it's very easy to fake agree with you, right? Yeah. If you're a comic and, 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 you know, what, what's even more important, it's easier to fake disagree with you. Right. Mm -hmm. Like if you're if you're Mm -hmm. making a totally valid logical point that goes against my politics, Mm -hmm. it's trivially easy for my mind to just give me this aversive reaction to what you're saying, bypass Mm -hmm. the logical part of my brain and just like, (laughs) fuck you, fuck this. And and basically to not concede, it's very easy to not concede a good point. It's virtually impossible to not laugh at a funny joke, even if that joke goes against all of your sort of political biases. So I I mean, I've, this has happened to me countless times and it's, it's also happened to people I know with really woke politics, for instance, Mm -hmm. where it's like a comedian will make a joke and the direction of that joke politically is the opposite of everything you believe, but it's, and it's not a preachy joke. It's just an extremely clever joke Mm -hmm. and you can't help yourself you're just laughing because it's so funny, even though you disagree with the underlying point that's being made. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're, you know, you're making me want to go back to stand up because <laughs> I haven't, <laughs> I haven't done stand up since COVID. Um, but you're right that, um, that, that feeling of 
involuntary laughter of legitimate laughter where like you put it you, you couldn't not laugh if you were trying mm -hmm. that is uh that is such a freeing feeling and i feel like that happens most often i would say live comedy is probably the best venue for that because mm -hmm. stand-up to me is a weird thing i mean there's so much bad stand-up out there right well, mm -hmm. there's a name for this somebody has this yeah. quote 90 percent of everything is crap right uh i forget that that's like somebody's postulate Mm -hmm. But it sounds to me like one of the most true things in the world. And that is true, including of stand up. But God damn it, when stand up is good, live stand up comedy, you've had exactly the right number of drinks, something in the two to three range. So you can still follow it, but you're but feeling you're a little bit. Yeah, you're you're, oh, there, there's certainly there's a bell curve there. You can go yeah. way too far with the drinks. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, when you're in that sweet spot and the comic is good, you I mean, that is the hardest you will laugh in your life. That is the hardest you will laugh in your life. I remember, you know, again, that Dave Chappelle show. I remember doing that at Lewis Black. I remember doing that at Patton Oswalt. I mean, it's it's you you're out of control and it's it's freeing and it's enormously fun. And what you're describing, what, what I was thinking about, that, that's an interesting point, by the way. I, I hadn't heard that point you just made about how sort of the laughter is involuntary, but the choosing to agree or disagree is voluntary it's those seem like polar opposite states of being <laughs> to me like the one where you are you know gripped with laughter and you can't stop and it's just happening to you and it's you know you're in convulsions versus uh a state of being where you're you're measured and you're controlled and you're thinking very strategically about what you say next and what you do next it's like god that sounds like a type of prison Right. And, you know, we all live in the second state for, you know, a good good portion of our, you know, maybe not that extreme, but like we do have to be living in a society here and be polite to each other. And that's good. But I don't want to live in that all the time. And uh, certainly when I walk into a comedy club and buy two, two drinks minimum, I would like to be freed from that straitjacket, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, on the topic of offense, I think that well, I'll say I'm I'm pretty close to a free speech absolutist. I'm I'm very mm -hmm. pro free speech. And I think there's this misimpression that people like me just never get offended. And that's why we're pro free speech because like we don't understand what it's like to to just hate something somebody said and to childishly wish that they they get somehow socially punished for saying it mm -hmm. and i can say having gone to a lot of comedy shows in the past three four years i do sometimes get straight up offended by things people say for sure yeah. like they they cross a line that maybe it's a line i didn't even know i had but it's just like that was not funny to me mm -hmm. yeah, and sometimes they're they're my friends are also offended by those jokes sometimes they're not Sometimes those jokes do really well in the crowd and it kind of makes me angry that more other people aren't offended by it. Mm -hmm. But I'm never under the impression that because I was offended that I somehow have the right to stop the show, heckle the comic. Um, oh God, I, yeah. I, I somehow have the like an obligation to put this comedian on blast on social media you know, like people will, you know, I, I know my, my friend owns the comedy seller. He'll get emails from people all the time saying this joke offended me. Sure. This comic is offensive, mm -hmm. you know? And again, I think it's, it relies on a kind of misunderstanding of the nature of the craft. It's like these people, uh, they're, they're doing a high wire act, right? Yeah. It's like, it's like criticizing a high wire act for being dangerous the danger mm -hmm. is a, a part of the thing itself, right? Like going yeah. towards what's offensive is not uh, a, a choice that you can sort of choose to do or not to do with comedy. It's, it's part of comedy. So yeah. it's inevitable that sometimes people are going to hit your tripwires, whatever mm -hmm. they are. And I think it's immature to say, well, my, my offense is so much more important than everyone else's offense that my offense should be like enshrined in our social yeah. norms and comics that violate my offense should suffer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, you know, this is why I used the phrase the religious left in that article, because it does strike me as the religious left at times, you know, the extreme versions of this type of behavior. It's, it's not a left-wing behavior. Anybody can do it. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, the, 
form of it that I was familiar with growing up was the religious conservative version. Because again, that's what most of the people around me were. And it was very much the same thing. They didn't like stand up for the exact same reasons. Mm -hmm. This person saying something who offends me, mm -hmm. you know, they're it, bad words a lot of the time. And hey, you are completely within your right to have that opinion. It becomes a problem when you're trying to impose your view of exactly what's acceptable on everyone else and not, you know, not in a light hand handed way at all, in a very heavy handed way where you're, yes, the, the, the most extreme version of it is writing to Gnome at the comedy seller and saying, don't have this comic on again because I didn't like the thing they say. But you're right. It is, you, 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 we all have the right to be offended by something. And I'm the same way. I, I'm close to a free speech absolutist. I mean, pretty close, certainly on that side of the spectrum. But yeah, I get offended by stuff. And it's kind of what you were talking about earlier with the, you know, meet your heroes moment where a, a comic you were, you like, and then they say something pretty dumb and you're like, well, but I didn't like that part. Uh, that does happen. You don't lose your right to feel that way when you're watching stand-up comedy. But I, yeah, I do think a, a broader space to say, to say what you want to say is definitely healthier. And especially when we're talking about stand-up comedy specifically, I mean, everyone has to understand <laughs> when you get on that stage the rules are a little different. Things need to not be taken quite so literally. You know, uh, if you say, take my wife, please, you can't have people in the audience go, he hates his wife. He just he just advocated his wife getting kidnapped. <laughs> that That is like the single most annoying form of, you know, Twitter justice is pretending to not get a joke so that you can get offended. That is mm. oh, that is just next level. Um, but I, you know. Again, I am for the wide berth. I got to say this. I enjoyed your interview with Charles Murray. Mm -hmm. I liked it. I and I don't agree with Charles Murray. And one of the things I liked about that conversation was. I think I have a better understanding of specifically why I don't agree with Charles Murray now. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I'm with you in that. I don't think it I don't think trying to shut people down is going to is going to lead to better ideas and a better society. I just don't think that works. I think it can occasionally be good at uh, silencing specific people. You know, Milo Yiannopoulos, you don't hear much from him anymore, uh, specific people. But then uh, ideas, I think it almost never works for silencing ideas. So even if I did agree with the concept that, you know, a very heavy hand in terms of what people can say and what's allowed is uh, appropriate, is, is an OK thing is conducive to good comedy even if i believed that i would not think that would have any success in terms of like getting rid of ideas that i don't particularly like right um so there's another point you make in your clapter article that i thought was really interesting uh you were talking about how conan's show was just pure comedy no politics mm -hmm. and that in America, we're losing a political spaces. There used to be a mm -hmm. lot of spaces where you can just sit out of politics. Right. And that share of the ecosystem is shrinking day by day. I mean, we're talking a few days after, um, you know, Eminem rebranded their, their mascots to be <laughs> sort of like gender inclusive yes. and they, they dropped the yeah. Mr. And the Mrs. And there was the, the, this, you know, the you're not allowed to sexually fantasize about M&Ms anymore. Right. It's, all, it's off the table right now. Yeah. And <laughs> um, so, you know, like as if as if the people at M&Ms that are profiting off of giving me diabetes give a shit about gender <laughs> equity. Right. <laughs> but um, and then there's obviously the the way that becomes the 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 main story in right wing news. Um, look at the left being crazy again. Um, you yeah, know, this, that, that, this that's just classic dynamic we have. That happened to uh, occur the week <laughs> I was writing an article for my Substack uh, about the show Gutfeld, the mm -hmm. new political comedy show on Fox. And I, mm -hmm. that happened. I saw the tweet and I was like, "Oh, here we go. This is going to be all <laughs> Gutfeld is this week." And sure enough, it's like they have a mole. It's like Fox News has a mole <laughs> in some of these corporations. Yeah. They're like, give us some content. Come on, do yeah, something weird. Exactly. Like, oh, we'll deliver. 
M&Ms are gay now. Um, <laughs> here's, it, here's each M&M sexuality and here's what they're into in bed. Right. <laughs> they're sex positive now <laughs> and they're fucking Skittles. Mm-hmm. Um, but the point is, the point is like, you know, at, certainly in, in the, in the George Floyd protest age and beyond, no corporation cannot have an opinion, right? Yeah. To not have an opinion is to side with the oppressor. Silence and, is and violence, so, right? Silence yeah. is violence, right? And you make this point that we're losing a political spaces. And uh, the way you phrased it, I thought was really, uh, really nice. You said that, you know, the political scientist in me is sorry to lose a non-political space. Democracy needs those in order for democracy to be tolerable. And I think, you know, that's a that's actually a very deep point. I don't mean to say actually. As oh, it must have been an make, accident. No. <laughs> as if you don't make deep points. <laughs> but, you know, in, in a non-democracy, in, in China, say, mm-hmm. politics, politics doesn't really dominate the corporate, corporate world or entertainment world because it quite literally dominates everything, right? It, it has a vice grip. So parad- paradoxically, politics threatens to creep into everything uh, mm-hmm. from M&Ms to, to you know, Twix. Um, because we're a multi-party democracy with freedom of speech and freedom of association, and it, it can feel more suffocating even though we have more freedom and, and even though politics is more suffocating in, in, a, in a place like China, right? Like there's no stand mm-hmm. to take on. The CCP runs everything and you're fucked if you criticize them. So yeah. in a way, there's nothing to talk about nothing to fight about, actually, where in America, there's always something to fight about. And that means there's always a risk of people feeling they have to plant their flag, or saying, Mm -hmm. you know, you know, Spotify can't stay out of politics, they have to either choose between Joe Rogan and Neil Young, and then it just creates a feeling of suffocation was like, where can I go to stay away from the political? Yeah, 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 you can you can spend all day lighting those fires and you have a clear incentive to if you happen to, you know, work for a cable news network or, you know, some other, you know, TV show where you have to find that kind of content. And now that I'm in the, you know, independent media substack space, it's like very clear that you can make a name for yourself, just, you know, fighting culture war battles all day and all night. Mm-hmm. But it, it does get tiring, doesn't it? And, you know, people do want to break, especially from the bullshit, you know, it's like, we're going to have a new Supreme Court justice. That's news. Russia has troops on Ukraine's border. That's news. M&Ms. Can I just not do the M&M thing, please? I, I, I would be fine if that was not part of my life <laughs> at all, at all. Either part of it, either the press release or the reaction to it. I just don't give a shit. So yeah, you do need space to like, just take a minute and get perspective and do realize, oh yeah, wait, I don't care about the M&Ms. And, you know, as you know, I talk about comedy a lot because I'm a comedian and that's what people ask me about. And that's when people want to know my opinions on things. Um, I don't want to give the impression that like that, like I've had it with political comedy and I'm through with. I mean, for Christ's sake, I'm still writing political comedy (laughs) and I really liked it. This is such an old man thing to say. I liked it the way it was 20 years ago. (laughs) I liked it the way. It's like everyone says the best SNL cast is the cast that was on when you were 14, right? Mm-hmm. Well, I liked it when I when uh, there was Conan and there was no politics in that whatsoever. It was just funny and goddamn was it funny. But then I also watched The Daily Show and The Daily Show was funny and there was politics in it. You know, it was a different thing. I feel like a good world would have pieces of both. And uh, yeah, it, it's things start to feel... <laughs> things start to feel constraining when it does feel like, Oh God, we've only got the one flavor. Now this is the, no matter what network I flip to, no matter what show I watch, this is what it's going to be. I do think, I do think, uh, soonish somebody will probably create a Conan type show, a Conan level, funny show, and it will be gigantic. Yeah. Yeah. Cause there's probably huge demand for a political stuff. I you, think people are the only out. game in town. Right. Yeah. Um, but you, you do make this point that in, in a lot of your Substack articles that, you know, the gender neutral M&M type stuff actually does have an effect on people's impression of the Democratic Party. Even yeah. if no Democrat comes out and, in support of it, 
right? Even if Democrats don't come out in support of something like defund the police, mm-hmm. the fact that there is an energetic movement of people on the left that have a lot of cultural and social power mm-hmm. that get outsized attention and aren't uh, loudly condemned, let's say, mm-hmm. by Democrats, that has the effect of besmirching the image of the Democratic Party somewhat unfairly, let's say. Let's mm-hmm. say it's an unfair reality that, you know, a Democratic senator is seen to be aligned with the party of <laughs> gender neutral MMs and defund right. the police, even if they personally think those are impractical and or ridiculous, have never yeah. supported it, you're seen to be affiliated with it. And that that matters when it comes to the fact that, you know, Democrats are potentially looking at losing a lot of Senate seats and mm-hmm. not having a governing majority for the foreseeable future. Yep. And this gets into, you know, I had David Shore on the podcast probably over mm-hmm. a year ago at this point to talk about his prescription for how the Democratic Party should go about, um, you know, winning. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so can you talk a little bit about what you think of basically the brand of the democratic party and how that can suffer via these culture war, crazy events? Yeah, th- this, um, I-, I wrote a three part <laughs> series about it because y- you actually summed up the, uh, the gist of that series pretty nicely that it does seem that brand is enormously important these days. Um, it's, and some of this thinking is very David Shore inspired, by the way. So I'm, I'm glad you brought him up brand matters. It matters, you know, just kind of like what group of people do people feel like they want to be a part of, do people want to hang out with Democrats? (laughs) Do people want to be a Democrat, say they're friend? Yeah, I voted for the Democrat. Is that a good thing? Is that a cool thing? And this does matter to me because, uh, you know, I fall on the left side of the political spectrum. So, uh, you know, I'm not a diehard party man, but I certainly, you know, that's the party I always end up voting for. So it really does matter to me, you know, the things that I want to see happen, the things that I want to see happen in terms of, you know, investing in people and climate change. I think we should have a lot of immigration like that's not going to happen if Republicans are dominating Congress. So this stuff does matter to me. And I think, yeah, the brand matters a lot. It matters. Do people think you're cool? (laughs) Do people want to hang out with you? And I do think Democrats have a big problem of, you know, there's this very annoying type of progressive activist. Just imagine the worst type of progressive activist. I mean, imagine like, you know, the morons in Portland who are trying to burn down that courthouse, who aren't even Democrats. They're like this, you know, black block anarchist thing. Um, They, you know, walk around chanting, fuck Joe Biden. And yet they get tied to the Democratic Party. And that's partly because right wing news media is really good at finding these clowns and putting them on TV and saying, whoa, <laughs> that's what that's what the left side of the political spectrum is. You know, do you really want to vote for those guys? That's a tried and true political tactic. It works. And I do think that Democrats would benefit a lot these days from just calling stupidity, stupidity the most ridiculous things. We don't need to swing in every pitch. It is unfair a lot of the time. I, <laughs> When I wrote those articles, it was right after uh, Terry McAuliffe got beat in Virginia. He lost the governor's race to Glenn Youngkin, the Republican. Uh, right before that happened, Twix created this weird woke commercial that was like, a, it's a Halloween commercial for Twix. Let me say that one more time, for Twix, Twix candy bars. And it had like a pro trans message that was executed in a really ham fisted way. I did picture like being in the Terry McAuliffe campaign offices in that moment and just thinking like, God damn it. So this is my problem now. I don't have any control. Over I'm running for it's governor of really, Virginia. I don't. It's probably like worth describing the video to people. It's like I, I just oh, watched sure. it. It's like two. it's like a two minute commercial. <laughs> and it's, uh, I guess, yeah. a, a, a little boy as in a biological male dressing up in, in a dress. And he has a baby like a goth babysitter. Is a goth babysitter. Yeah. And, and then, uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. It's you. It's probably just best to watch. I linked to it in the article. The article is called Why Everyone Hates the Educated Left. It's on my Substack. I might be wrong. But yeah. So the goth babysitter, uh, she has very, like, she has like witch powers. 
there are so many pieces to this. <laughs> <laughs> Just as, as we're describing this 90 second commercial, it's pretty clear that things have gone off the rails because there are so many pieces to this. But yes, she has. It's implied that she's a witch. And it's also implied that the kid is trans, even though mm -hmm. it's just a boy in a dress. Boy in a dress, not necessarily. I actually trans. didn't even notice it was a boy in a dress until the end of the video. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, then which there's is interesting uh, reason number six thousand eight hundred and twelve why this ad doesn't work because if they had, <laughs> they had a message and you missed it because you were focused on the goth babysitters witch powers. Correct. Yeah, that, I thought yeah. that was the center of the video. So Gage, moving into Act Three of this ninety-second uh, video, the the witch and the kid are at a park, and the kid starts getting bullied for wearing a dress. You know, the bully's going, "Why are you wearing a dress? You're different. It's weird." And the witch summons her witch powers, witch nanny summons her witch nanny powers, and blows the kid away. She summons a gust of wind and blows the bully away. And I did think one. Some people are like, "It's bullying." A you know, you're. Like, did she kill that kid? I thought it was like, well, it's kind of cartoony. <laughs> I, I did also yeah. think the way you're supposed to do this in TV or whatever is you're supposed to show the kid at the end, like stuck in a tree, but okay. Yes. So, that, so that's the moment <laughs> I was waiting for. Like, what, what I thought was weird about it is, so the kid says like, he bullies the kid for like 10 seconds, right? Yeah. And it was mean. It was bad. But it was about 10 seconds. And also seconds doesn't mention Twix. But yes. Yeah. To, it, yeah. And then the, <laughs> the witch. Twix free bullying just like disappears him and they don't show him like blowing away like oh he got stuck in a tree he's just gone and his like clothes yes. are left there like, did she <laughs> did she kill a kid it's, after 10 seconds of, of anti-trans bullying your candy like, commercial has gone so far off the rails if the question <laughs> people have at the end is did a child just die yeah did i just see a child and like all the al get are the alternatives here like be a bigot against trans kids or 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 different kids it's, or like kill the kids that are bigots like surely that... there's a middle ground <laughs> surely there's a middle ground it's also it's such an easy fix you just show the kid at the end in a tree yeah, fine right uh but and yeah they funny. didn't know what they're doing it's it's funny so it's a it's a great your, hate watch your broader point is that this kind of stuff influences people's picture of democrats whether right one likes it or not right right whether you like it or not and I think I think the best thing you can do uh, if you're on the left is when something stupid happens, call it stupid. I mean, I think that's a stupid so ad. One point about that uh, and another point to make after this. But, you know, when you call something stupid, when you call out the excesses of the, uh, the excesses of the left, mm -hmm. the left is very quick to destroy you. Parts of it are. Yeah. Well, I mean, so, and you've, I mean, you've got, I mean, you were kind of, you know, you were right at the center of the storm there. I know. So, right. But, but let, let, like, so let's take the example of, did you use the sort of Antifa Oregon Portland people as an example before? Right. Uh, I, well, I used them, you know, just now in this podcast, I'm not sure I've written about them. Right. right. I mean, they're obviously clownish. Yeah. So, so I think of the example of, of Winston Marshall, who was in the band Mumford and Sons mm -hmm. and he, he tweeted approvingly a book by Andy No that was the whole book was the thesis is Antifa is bad, mm -hmm. um, which is not that controversial, actually. I mean, Sh I think, shouldn't be, shouldn't yeah. be. And, it, yeah. and, you know, Andy No is a guy that had been physically assaulted and sent to the hospital by, by Antifa, if, if I remember that correctly. Um, these are, you know, these are violent goons that, that use their ideology to justify violence. Um, so he basically tweeted a link to this book and he was like, hey, this is, looks like a good book. He says something like that. Mm -hmm. Very just kind of a, a, a light. Pretty, pretty innocuous, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And he 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 got the band came up under so much criticism that he he basically he wasn't fired, but he left of his own accord because of just like how much scrutiny the band came under for that one tweet. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's part of the challenge of the left calling out excesses on its own side is that no one yeah. wants to end up the next Winston Marshall and few, just a few examples of those can create a really um, destructive norm of never criticizing your own for fear of being eaten by your own. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I hope people don't underestimate just how real 
that feeling is. <laughs> I, I, I feel it. I felt it last week tonight. You know, there are things that you just sort of know. If you talk about them in a certain way, you might get a lot of shit for it. And, you know, because the, the sort of decent, well, sort of decent is probably giving it too much credit. But sometimes, you know, these cases, the Mumford and Sons guy, David Shore was another high profile cancellation. You know, James Bennett got pushed out at the New York Times, Don McNeil, the, the guy at Apple who wrote the book. You know, there are these, you know, high profile cases of somebody getting a lot of shit and then maybe getting fired for something that makes a lot of people go for that. And one response to that is, yeah, look, you know, James Bennett got forced out. He's no longer the op-ed uh, editor at the New York Times. He's not going to go live in a refrigerator box on Skid Row. He's going to get another job. And OK, David Shore, it because it got so much attention and people realized, holy shit, this guy's really smart. <laughs> I think it's actually been good for his career. Right. Um, so like, I do hear that in the terms of like what problems exist in America, you know, there are a lot more serious problems than no longer having your job at the New York times. I get that. I, I hear that understood, but it's this thing that you're talking about here, the chilling effect, the realization among so many other people that like, holy shit, I could be the next Munford and Stunts guy. I could be the next David Shore. And it gets really crazy when it's like not famous people, when it's people who are not in media, people who are not public figures in any way, shape or form could get in trouble for something pretty innocuous. Um just if it's it's not even if there's a broad movement against them, just if like just enough people on Twitter decide this is an ax they want to grind. Yeah, it's unhealthy. And, you know, bring it back to comedy. It affects comedy. It's just a, a constant question of. Do I want to say that? Is that is that just worth it? Is that worth it? Does this exist on TV shows? Yes, I wrote on a TV show. I felt it. You know, you can say that maybe I was the paranoid one. Maybe I was, you know, maybe I shouldn't have felt pressure that I was feeling, but I can tell you that I was feeling it and it did affect. I like to think <laughs> I like to think I tried to ignore it as much as possible. But yeah, there are absolutely times to go like, this joke. It's usually just offensive jokes, right? Mm -hmm. It's a joke that somebody somewhere could consider offensive. I, t I mentioned this in, in one of the articles. At one point, there was a joke that was deemed too offensive to the state of Florida. And I went, OK, like this is we, if you can't make fun of Florida, a joke that Florida, by the way, loves. Florida <laughs> is totally in on that joke. Florida man's a thing. You go to a comedy club in Florida. They're going to be they're going to be a little upset if you didn't even mention that you were in Florida. <laughs> they're totally into that joke. And you we couldn't say it. And uh, that does kind of make you think, have we gone slightly insane? I think maybe we've gone a little insane. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's this, you know, the, the, the point you make, though, about the. All of these culture war excesses affecting the image of, of Democrats, I think also goes the other way. Right. Like, I think every mass shooting with a gun mm -hmm. that is legally purchased Mm -hmm. hurts the image of every Republican politician. Yeah. Even the ones that are more moderate and, and or centrist in their opinion on, on gun rights, like just, just being the party that is in general against or relative to Democrats, at least against gun control measures. You know, mm -hmm. like every time someone goes and shoots up a school, it's bad for the image of every Republican fairly or not. Um, you know, obviously the 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 Capitol riot is horrible for was horrible for the image of Republicans, mm -hmm. and uh, fairly or not, mm -hmm. and um, and so it seems like this this is definitely a point that that goes both ways. No. Oh yeah. Oh, I mean, no question. If you are a Republican and January sixth is happening, and you're not out there saying as loudly as you possibly can, "Holy shit! Stop this! This mm -hmm. is this is insane." by no means can this be allowed everyone break it up go home and then i would add to that um personally i i think you should not try to steal an election whether you're doing it by violent means or nonviolent means if you lose you lose i think that's a pretty core democratic principle 
So yeah, absolutely. If when bad shit happens and you're not out there <laughs> loudly saying bad shit, well, then if somebody ties it to you, well, then I guess it's kind of fair, isn't it? I mean, I, you know, I, I'll bring up one example. When Charlottesville happened, we did a piece on Charlottesville that week on last week tonight. And Trump, you may remember, he gave this press conference where he was surprisingly soft on the people who marched in Charlottesville, the, you know, hard right, I don't know how you want to characterize them, but the hard right Nazi might be a fair term, but they're at the very least hard right people marching in Charlottesville. And Trump gave this press conference where this is the one where he famously called them, you know, good people on both sides. If you watch the whole clip, it's a little more complex, but he was way softer than you would expect. Mm -hmm. I thought we were totally right on the show to criticize him for not loudly and clearly saying these people represent something that is it's awful it we can it cannot be mainstream in america and they're violent which is also unacceptable and we did do a piece that was 20 minutes long that basically said that i wanted in that piece to have one beat exactly one beat in a 20 minute piece uh that also pointed out by the way also antifa folks when Nazis are out there marching, don't show up and fight with them. That doesn't help anything. Don't bring your stupid homemade blowtorch and your goddamn, you know, uh, mask and your motorcycle helmet. That doesn't help anything. Don't do that. Stay home. I felt like that was a completely reasonable point to make in that moment because we were rightly criticizing Trump for not criticizing his side. I thought we should criticize, quote unquote, our side. That beat didn't make it in. You know, beats don't make it into pieces all the time. That's not really weird. But I do think I do think it was a feeling of this just isn't kind of the right thing to say at this moment, which is unfortunate because it ended up being more skewed than it needed to be. I think in the interest of staying true to the principle of denouncing, quote unquote, your side when your side is doing something crazy, which is, by the way, by far the more effective form of denunciation than the opposite. I mean, if a Democrat points to Republicans, says that Republicans doing a bad thing? It's like, well, that's what they say all day, every day. And the opposite's also true. A Democrat criticizing Republican, Republican criticizing a Democrat means nothing. It, that just bounces off of everyone's heads. They're like, OK, yeah, that's just dog bites man. That means nothing. When somebody's criticizing their quote unquote own side, I think it has a little more purchase. Mm -hmm. I think it it means a little more. And yeah, I think it's something that that needs to be done to you know maintain the health of your own side, make sure make sure you're ter uh, moving in the right direction. I think and, this is why Bill Maher is is so good uh, at at doing this. Like, you yeah, know, he, he's the type of guy that in that moment would put the beat in about Antifa, um, and and a lot of people like, sort of roll their eyes at that. But you know, it, it occurs to me from from reading your piece, actually, you had some graphs that showed Bill Maher's ratings are usually better than all of these other shows, and I'm curious the the extent to which that kind of like never criticize our own norm which is probably popular in the subcultures of these writers rooms to what extent is that bad for ratings are they do they have a norm that is actually bad for them or is it also are the incentives aligned no my guess my guess and this is only a guess is that it's bad for ratings um, it's really hard to, with, with ratings. It's hard to tell. You know, that, those ratings were from my Greg Gutfeld article, which you'd be shocked how many people are watching Gutfeld. It's a lot mm -hmm. of people. Right. Um, and yeah, Mar Mars, Mars. OK, just steady. Mars numbers have been, you know, I've worked in TV, so I, I've been looking at numbers for a long time. Mars numbers are pretty steady. He's got his audience. He does his thing. He, he does not give a fraction of a fuck at this point. And yes, that is appealing to a lot of a lot of people. He, he doesn't he'll, he'll say what he thinks, no matter what you think of Bill Maher. He says what he thinks. Um, my guess is that an a, a highly self-censuring perspective, my guess is that that is on the balance bad for ratings. There may be room for like one or two shows that hew very closely to the, you know, the true blue talking points and they never color outside the lines ever, ever once. There might be room for one of the one or two of those. I mean, as I said before, like MSNBC is a thing. MSNBC, you know, they don't they're not totally killing it, but it is a successful network. Mm -hmm. 
maybe space for one or two of those shows. They're kind of, we have kind of <laughs> fallen into this thing where there are like, I don't know, five or six shows offering a pretty similar perspective. Uh, maybe the market's a little overly split, uh, you know, splitting the pie six ways and nobody's got a big enough slice at this point. It's, it's hard to tell because there are two dynamics here, right? There's, there's like, is the show successful? Are people watching the show successful in the, you know, traditional terms of like, are people watching it? Is it making the network money? That's one question. And then another question is the people making the show, are they succeeding in their own environment? And I'm talking about mm -hmm. like office politics here. I'm talking about advancing your career. Are you going to advance your career if you get hired at a show or if maybe if you've even been at the show for a while, but especially if you get hired at a show and you come in and say, you know what? I disagree. And just, you know, every day it's a new thing. I disagree about that. I think we're being a little myopic here. I think we're, I think we've got tunnel vision. Is that going to make you popular? Is that going to advance your career? No, it's not. It's a lot better to come in and this makes some logical sense and go, I know what this show is. I know what we do here. So you know what I'm going to pitch? I'm going to pitch more of the stuff that we do here. And that dynamic, it's, it's going to cause the show to kind of self-perpetuate. Mm -hmm. So I do think right. that's happening sometimes. So even if the question of, is this good for ratings? You know, that one, I don't know. It might not be. But even if it's not, the internal office dynamic is probably going to keep shows producing a lot of the content that they have been producing prior. Right. And it, it's, it's also possible that once you curate your audience, that you yeah. know trevor noah suddenly starting to do more bill maher type stuff might not be good for trevor noah it's like he might does he actually expand his audience do new people start to like him or does he just lose part of his audience right it's mm -hmm. not obvious it's risky it no nobody knows um yeah i have heard i haven't watched the daily show recently but i have heard he's like changing things up a little bit i know they went through a huge format change mm -hmm. they definitely did that in terms of perspective, I, yeah, I don't know. Perhaps he's noticing the thing that I'm noticing. He's like, Jesus, there are six shows saying the exact same things. <laughs> Maybe he's thinking he's going to mix it up. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. So going back to David Shore's critique of the Democratic Party, I want to deal with this a little bit more because I think it's it's really interesting. Sure. There are basically two opposing views about how democrats should try to win strategically so mm -hmm. just take it as a given that one is a democrat and wants to win mm -hmm. in a country like america there are two views on how to do that one is to win over swing voters mm -hmm. to get you know independents and moderate democrats that can be poached by republicans and to somehow make them more likely to vote for democrats than republicans Mm -hmm. uh, and then you could disagree about how to do that. Is it like we talk more about stuff they like, or we just don't talk about stuff they don't like, whatever. That's one broad mm -hmm. category. And then there's another category, which is actually our strategy should not be to win over swing voters that might go Republican or Democrat. Instead, let's try to get as many people voting for Democrats as possible. Let's try to increase the turnout, right? In, in America, mm -hmm. you know, like roughly half of people don't vote, right? And at the margin, there, there's a group of people that if they're going to vote, they're going to vote Democrat, right? Mm -hmm. But they might not vote at all. They have to be excited to get out of bed and vote for someone. And so there's a strategy that just appeals to mobilizing those kinds of people to, and increasing your numbers that way, as opposed to... Uh, you know, winning over swing voters by showing them that you're not too lefty, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Shore's, Shore basically believes, David Shore believes that the Democratic Party is doing too much of the second strategy and not enough of winning over swing voters. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I definitely think there is a culture within the electoral politics community of being way more excited about mobilization uh, than winning over swing voters. I don't think winning over swing voters is viewed as as cool if you're like <laughs> a 25-year-old yeah. person working in electoral politics in the Democratic Party. 
you yeah. don't want to be the kind of David Shore esque character. It's just a little bit harder to function and be seen as cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and and it, you know, an, another interesting part of that is those two strategies wouldn't exist in a place like Australia that has mandatory voting, where like voter turnout is like ninety plus right. percent. Right. Mobilizing wouldn't work, presumably, because everyone's sort of already voting. Mm-hmm. But in America, where nobody votes you can have this, these, this kind of disagreement about whether to like hammer and and get excited about super progressive candidates, as opposed Mm -hmm. to winning over the proverbial guy that lives in Michigan and Uh like voted for Obama once and Trump once. And, you know, so what do you sort of make of that? uh, Those two strategies? Yeah, I, I feel like this question can probably be answered. I mean, the way you framed it, if, if we assume that the goal is to have Democrats win, and we're just framing that as the only goal, I feel like that question can be answered statistically. And I think that it, to my mind, it more or less has been answered statistically by, you know, people like Nate Silver, you know, these are not popular people on the far left, but people like Nate Silver and uh, Matt Iglesias, uh, Josh Barrow's written about this a little bit. I feel like the uh, you can do it all through turnout. I feel like that argument is on extremely shaking, shaky footing at this point. I think it's quite clear that swing voters, though they are you know much smaller in number than they used to be. No, I don't think anybody's debating that. You have to convert people. That's simply how it works. No, there are not a ton of these people, but there are enough. Like you said, Trump to Biden, Biden to Youngkin, if you're in Virginia voters, there are enough to make a difference. I think that's a statistical point. I am aware that like, when I'm saying, you know, Democrats should, you know, loudly and proudly say, look, Antifa, these people are nuts. They don't represent us in any way, shape or form. Defund the police. That's the stupidest three words anyone has ever said. We don't want any part of any of that shit. Easy for me to say, because that is what I think. So I it's what I believe. And I am also arguing that it's good politics. So I'm very aware of, you've probably heard the phrase, the pundits fallacy, Mm -hmm. which is where the pundit believes that everything that they believe is also good politics. I, I worry about that. That is why I go to the statistical case that people like, again, Nate Silver, David Shore, Matt Iglesias are making, which I think still, I, I think it's pretty conclusive in my mind. You have to win over swing voters. You have to do it. I would also point out that the people who are saying, no, you can just do it through mobilization. I think they may be the ones engaging in, you know, what you might call the pundits fallacy and that they're the ones, look, that viewpoint is another way of saying, we don't have to make any compromises ever. Right. Everything we love, everything we're for, from Medicaid for all to forgiving all student debt to, you know, any list of, it's it's actually... If you think back to what we were talking about during the Democratic presidential primary, it's insane when you imply it to like what's actually going to happen to to happen today. It's like, should we, you know, should we spend $10 trillion on green infrastructure? It's like, this is all going to get filtered through Joe Manchin. Why are we debating uh, how big of a Medicare for all system we would like? It's all going to go through Joe Manchin. We are, if we're lucky, going to get beefed up Obamacare subsidies. That is the cutting edge of this debate. But you don't have to engage with that cutting edge if you are of the mindset that it's all about turnout. You can do it all through turnout. It can become a form of magic pixie dust that you can just sprinkle on everything and go, look, look, popular revolution, socialist revolution. It's around the corner. It's going to happen this time. As soon as people figure out how great these ideas are, we're going to have gigantic turnout and we will ride that to victory. I do think the extreme form of that argument, and you know, I, I admit that I am giving the cartoonish form of that argument, but I do think it's a, a form of wishful thinking. I personally don't find it persuasive. And again, I do think that the numbers suggest that you can't just do it all through turnout. You do have to win people over. Uh, there's also, I mean, one thing that's compelling about David Shore, and I think if Matt Iglesias agrees here, that that kind of argument is, yeah, they're they're argue they're usually making a lot of points that someone like me would agree with, right? 
and you can worry about the pundits fallacy. Like, isn't it, isn't it convenient that I really hate defund the police? And I also think defund the police wouldn't get the Dem- Democrats elected. Yeah. How, what a coincidence that all of my opinions align <laughs> with the opinions that would win. Um, right. You know, I actually don't think David Shore is saying that because many of the policies, or at least a substantial amount of the policies that he thinks are popular to mm-hmm. swing voters, are not uh, economically right wing or not economically moderate. Like there are certain yeah. policies that Bernie would support that are pretty popular and that actually mainstream Democrats don't talk enough about. Yeah. So, you know, and then, of course, the stuff that really swing voters don't like, they they definitely don't like the far left race and gender stuff. Mm -hmm. But there are plenty of uh, at at least some far left, if you could call it that, in terms of sort of Bernie style economic policies that would make Democrats more popular if you talked about them more and um, that that Democrats have a more popular stance on than than Republicans. So. Mm -hmm. And I'm not even sure I would be for all of those policies. So it, it it seems like it definitely seems there is a strong case to be made for Shore's perspective here. And it's it's one that Democrats definitely have to sort out if they don't want to lose a bunch of Senate seats um, yeah. a, a, later this and, year. And, and, you know, I, I'm glad that you pointed out that this idea that, you know, we should talk about things that are popular, it doesn't clearly break down into right wing and left wing views. I, I feel like the straw man response to that argument is, you know, oh, well, you just want us to become more conservative. You just want us, to, you know, the, the really bad form of the argument is like, you just want us to adopt the opinions of some racist white guy out there. No, we're talking about things like the child tax credit, which I think is, I think it's a good politics. I just wrote a piece about it. I think it's good politics. I think it's good policy. I think it's a thing that would help people get by. So that's the type of stuff we're talking about. And I, I think you're also right that the, God, we, we, we lack words for this, but yeah, the extreme lefty activist race and gender stuff. What do you want to call that? I don't know. I've used the phrase religious left it works for me. Intersectional left is pretty good. Intersectional left is good. Yeah, this is, John McWhorter needs to get on this. Come on, he's a linguist guy. Give us, please, give, give us a new. The, uh, the oh wait, he did the elect. Okay, the elect, apologies yeah. to John McWhorter. He did. Okay, and he, but the policy when he's talking about the elect, he's talking about the people I've talked about in pieces. It's just it's this weird this weird pejorative. It's it's this le, le, left far left wing activist set. One strange element of it is that. It is overwhelmingly white, you know, like that should not be lost. It's not entirely white, but it's like overwhelmingly white. And yeah, they have these, the it's, they have these views on race and gender that I think they're, I think they're, you know, poison in terms of electoral politics in ways that we're maybe not totally grasping. You know, if you talk about, I just mentioned the child tax credit, tax credits are always a little fiddly. You know, people got to figure out, okay, wait, so I'm going to get how much money and when, but under what conditions, you know, it's tax policy. It's a little complicated. Even that's a pretty simple one. But if you start, start talking about, you know, other things I support, like the earned income, earned income tax credit, or how we should be supporting capital gains taxes, you know, you're rightly going to get a big what from people because you're getting pretty far in the weeds at that point. It's hard for people to really feel that stuff. It's hard for people to really get what you're talking about. But when you have a press release where we say the M&Ms are totally different, people get that. People understand that when, you know, the really extreme stuff about, you know, uh, sex, biological sex is entirely a construct. You know, that does cause people to go, what? Wait, entirely what? We really lose people when we talk about that stuff because it's salient. They get it. You know, they get that that's that they get that defund the police is a little nuts. So I do think that the hymnal that the, I'll go back to the term, the elect are reading from is, it's just another language as far as most Americans are concerned. And I don't think most Americans are wrong. It's a weird, 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 uh, there's that word again, I apologize. <laughs> well, it's no, it's, it, it is tough to talk about it without using that word. 
I mean, yeah, it's it's like, cultish like, in its weird, it's its worst forms. It can right. get that far. When I look at how you know Orthodox Jews live in in New York, I can recognize just how different a subculture it is from my own. It's you know they're speaking right. Yiddish, and you know I couldn't I couldn't just go to a party and feel comfortable. And, and it, it would it would be no comment on them as people. It would be a comment on just the massive gap between my culture and theirs. And you know, like when you go to a party and half the people there go by they rather than he or she, mm-hmm. um, you know, not quite to the same extent, but there is a, a feeling of alienation of like, let's say this is the first time you've been around a they before. After all, people that go by they are probably less than 1% of mm-hmm. that, like really reliably go by. They are probably very, it's small not many. The population, it's not, yeah. Right. All and right. it's, it's very counterintuitive to retrain the way you speak English mm-hmm. definitely past a certain age. Um, so let's say you're in an environment like that. It's really uncomfortable because everyone there that's like been going to a progressive college and been doing this, been practicing the they Mm -hmm. the gender fluid speak for years it's almost second nature to them for you it's not second nature and uh you're not really sure how important it is in terms of actual social justice like it doesn't really (laughs) feel the same as selma but it's like it's (laughs) presented (laughs) as if it's the same as selma and getting it wrong marks you as a bigot kind of in the same way as being opposed to dr king would have so it's like it's sold there's a big distance between how it's sold how important it's it's being it's it's branding is is being portrayed as how really genuinely difficult it is to to not feel alienated doing it yeah and so it is i'm sorry it's weird it is weird to people (laughs) that are not (laughs) <laughs> that do, that don't come from it and um For, foreign is does that make it better yeah it's, it's weird i mean i'm trying to not be insulting to my opponents but but yeah yeah i mean if there and, and and what's more like if there were a really clear if there were a really clear logical argument for it um it would be so it would be so much easier to sell here here's yeah. the Here's the soundbite reason why it's extremely important for you to call me they, right? But mm-hmm. the problem is the arguments for it are very fuzzy. They don't, they're not simple. Often, yeah. They're, they're, I mean, they're as convoluted as like the argue, like theological arguments about the nature of God and like how many yeah. genders there are, is like how many angels can live on the head of a pin. Mm-hmm. Um, and <clears throat> when you're trying to convince people to do something really weird and different, uh, it matters that you have like a really simple argument for it. So like, say what you want about vegans. If you want to mm-hmm. call vegans weird, you can, I, I don't think it's that weird, but they have a very straightforward argument. Animals are capable mm-hmm. of suffering to, they can feel pain like humans feel and to the extent that we can, we should not eat them and not factory farm them and not kill them, not cause them to suffer. Say what you want about that argument, agree, agree with it or don't. It is very simple and it's very logical. Yeah. The yeah. argument for gender being a social construct is neither simple nor logical. Um, it's uh, like the moment you press on it, it it you know it, it's like unclear even what the argument is there's so many disagreements from people within that camp and it's extremely hard to get one's head around why it's as straightforward a, a social justice issue as like uh you know racism for instance or jim crow so i i, I admit to to losing the thread on that sometimes and perhaps that's my <laughs> fault i do try to follow it the difference between sex and gender which i mm-hmm. think i understand mm-hmm. but then it does seem to some people and again it always depends on who's making the argument you know there's sure. a better version of this argument is probably out there somewhere but yes it seems it's also it's often there's a difference between sex and gender but then gender is all that matters and that one is totally subjective and that is an argument if nothing else it's not simple uh you are going to lose some people i mean 
I'm more worried when the when the discussion doesn't even happen. I noticed so earlier you made a joke uh, about me walking around in blackface, mm -hmm. and you the the words you used I think were something like if you w walked around in like clear back blackface, you said which mm -hmm. now tell me if I'm wrong. It sounded there like you were making a distinction between like blackface, like Al Jolson would wear blackface, like minstrelry, and you know on SNL twenty years ago when somebody would be doing an impression of a specific person. And they would wear, you know, makeup. And it wasn't Al Jolson blackface, but it was, you know, bronzer right. to look like that person. Like Fred Armisen that, bronze to look like Obama. Right. Jesse, uh, uh, Daryl Hammond played Jesse Jackson back in yeah, the day. Yeah, that, that is the distinction yeah. I was making. That is, yeah, yeah I, I thought so. I yeah. thought so because you're the type of person who thinks about these things. But that's just broadly a conversation that, that didn't ever happen. It's it's a little weird. It didn't ever happen. And people called up all these old clips and acted like there was no distinction. And like, I'm not even taking a position on what exactly the rule should be. I'm just noting that we didn't ever have a conversation about, like, are these two things different or is is one like the other? And if not, why? Um, that conversation didn't really ever happen. It was just sort of, uh, you know, some people on Twitter took a position and a lot of people went, you know what, this is just not worth it for me to talk about. Right. And, and I think that is, that does lead to the, the type of alienation that you're talking about. Cause if we, if we take like the, the vegan example or the Orthodox Jewish example, it's not just, this is how I choose to live. And that's why it's also, and all of you need to live that way. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the ex extra, bit of poison that's thrown out there. And if you don't, it's real bad. You're going to get called, you know, a racist or a bigot, which is, you know, not a small charge. That is a, those are big charges. So I think that's the moment when people start to go, Jesus. So Jesus. So if I don't, if I don't, you know, completely adhere to the rules, which we never discussed. You just told me what they are. If I, mm -hmm. if I don't adhere to those rules, and as you pointed out, like, maybe I even want to, but I'm just not very good at it yet. I, it wasn't that long ago that people would, they, they would not say, you know, a transgender person, they would say a transgendered person, which is the second one is incorrect, but it seems like a totally like reasonable mistake to make. People can make that type of mistake all the time. Their intentions aren't bad. They just aren't up to date on the latest terms. And it, it does feel like a world where uh, if you make if you if you make that little slip, somebody's going to go, ah, ah, ha, 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 bigot. That is a world just people don't want to live in that world. And I don't I don't want to live in that world. You know, I don't blame them. We have to we have to approach these things in a way that actually makes sense and are rules we can all understand and actually, you know, adhere to in the real world and not just not just make people think, God, I don't want to hang around with folks like that. <laughs> right. And I, I guess what what really seems dysfunctional about it isn't the fact of shaming people. I mean, you know, people have been shaming people forever and you should shame people for doing really bad things, right? Mm -hmm. That are just clearly bad. You shame people for murder. Shame right. on you for the murder. That's yeah. I have no problem shaming pedophiles, right? Like yeah, this that's is right. There's not a shame intrinsically is not it's an important actually tool of absolutely like shaping people's incentive to behave well. The problem is when there is basically a set of rules that are it seems basically created by like left wing college academics operating in a very tiny subculture mm -hmm. that then just like through no process through no democratic process become the rules for basically the whole elite and even sub elite world without any kind of process for vetting good rules for from bad rules and without any kind of consistency in the way they're applied so like for instance the blackface thing why did megan kelly get fired right she got fired for uh, questioning whether blackface in every case was racist, right? She took for granted that in many cases it was racist, but, you know, is it racist if a little kid loves Beyonce and like out of innocent, 
admiration dresses up like Beyonce. Okay. That mm-hmm. was her question. That's what she got fired for saying. Can, can now, I add one thing there? Sure. Also, her show was on the ropes at that moment. That, that <laughs> so it was, it was a straw that broke the camel. If, if that had been a ratings hit, she probably could have survived that. But yeah, please continue. Um, but, um, you know, like there are countless people that have actually done blackface. Uh, you're blurring out on me. Yeah, I know what happened there. I was trying to get more light in you. Oh, there we go. Okay. I'm back. All right. Um, there, there are countless people that have actually done blackface, you know, in living memory that are more culturally left figures like Jimmy Fallon, Jimmy Kimmel, Fred Armisen did sort of honey face, Sarah Silverman, you know, all people that are sort of in good standing, despite having actually done something that Megyn Kelly only talked about and she got way more flack for it. And, you know, this is why people have this sense when there's some new rule that is a culturally left rule and they think, no, you're full of shit and you're going to use this to fuck over people you don't like. And you're going to use it selectively. It's not going to be people distrust the motives behind social justice rules for good reason, because they are so often abused, applied selectively to people to, to get rid of people that basically the cultural left does not like. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. You know, another example is, is like uh, J- Joy Reid um, on MSNBC. She, she, she used to write really quite homophobic blog posts. Um, I, I can't remember exactly what beliefs they were, but they were, they were bad. Like they were really ugly homophobic beliefs that she used to hold and blog about. Um, and they sort of got unearthed and she actually initially pretended that her old blog had been hacked and she hadn't written them. Uh, you know, as if someone was hacking her blog, yeah. writing, writing homophobic I, shit. I, now, I, now I remember this. Yeah. yeah. And then, and then eventually she came clean, apologized for it. And it's okay. Like she's in good standing um, at, at MSNBC. And, you know, but this is the kind of thing where if, if it had happened to someone that the cultural left didn't like, mm-hmm. you know, would have been potentially career ending. Right. And so these things are applied selectively. It's unclear yeah. what the standard is and people distrust the motive. It feels like politics by other means. Yeah. Well, you're right that if nothing else, it does prove that these things can be used as weapons. It doesn't right. mean they're weapons in every case. Sure. I mean, I would, you know, Jimmy Fallon and Jimmy Kimmel, like they, they did get shit for that. They did survive it. Yeah. I don't know what that tells us. Um, you're, yeah, you're right that <laughs> in Megyn Kelly's instance, I mean, people didn't like Megyn Kelly. So of course they saw here's an opportunity. And again, that show was struggling as it is. If it had been a gigantic hit, that'd probably be a different story. I, when that happened, I was at last week's night and, oh, you know, some people in the office were just giddy. They just, it's, it gets down to just, you know, personal feelings. It's like, I don't like this person. Right. Uh, so yeah, it does prove that. But like, these how, things... how giddy were they to, to, for instance, like destroy Jimmy Fallon? Probably not so giddy, right? Oh, uh, not, not, no, not nearly. Though that happened after I left, but, but no, it, yeah, it would not have been. It was very much because they had a pre existing dislike for Megyn Kelly. Right. So, and I don't remember if the show did anything, but I do remember people in the office were very, ha ha ha, got, you know, got her, got right. her, finally got her. It's ugly. That's, that's one of the things that, um, I don't think people always, always realize the way these, um, you know, culture war stories can be hits. I mean, in, you know, cable news, comedy shows. And now that I'm in the Substack world, like it's totally clear to me that the way if I if my singular goal was to go out and get the most subscribers I could possibly get, just do culture war stuff all the time. Just do that all the time. Mm -hmm. Wait for somebody. It's 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 the equivalent of like what the right does when the M and M's thing comes out. It's like Mm -hmm. wait (laughs) wait for somebody to fuck up and then just nail them. Like that's a great way to do it. You know what? This kind of brings it back around because you get that version of clapter that Twitter does, don't you? you? You say something that people feel compelled to agree with and then they publicly agree with it. Maybe they retweet it. That's great attention for your Substack. 
I think that's really unbecoming. I, I really wish we would do that less because yeah, the, you know, for lack of a better term, gigantic boner that we would get at last week tonight when some, when something like legitimately racist happened and we got to go <laughs> racist, like that was too fun for us. It should not have made us that giddy. It had not, it should not have been such a guarantee that that was going to get on the show because, you know, coming back to your shame point, like you do want to make points about what's accept what you think should be acceptable and, and what's not, you know, you do need to shame people sometimes call them out if you want to use that phrase, but it, you shouldn't be joyful about it. It shouldn't be giddy and it shouldn't be the bulk of what you do. And I, I apologize if it sounded like I singled out last week tonight. That's just my experience. That's the show I happen to work at any show that is like, really making the most of that type of content. Uh, it's personally not a, not a show I want to watch a whole lot. And I hope that other forms of media can kind of, you know, at least pop up and replace that so that if people want to, you know, intake the less contentious stuff, they at least have that option. Right. I, I think, you know, people want to, uh, as we we're, we're always building a new culture, the culture is always changing and we're coming up mm -hmm. with new norms, but we have to come up with norms that survive the shoe on the other foot test. Like when it's someone yeah. you like, how punitive should we be if a person had bigoted opinions that they expressed 20 years ago? Yeah. Whatever your answer to that question, it has to survive the person being someone that you think is good for the world. Right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like, what should the punishment be for failing to, for like, you know, messing up someone's pronouns, for instance, mm -hmm. like, whatever your answer to that has to be compatible with that mistake being made by someone you love. Yeah, right. Um, right. And too many of the norms that are, I think, being, being invented sort of don't survive that test. And, you know, when it comes to the, the sort of culture war feeding red meat to the audience, this is something I try to police myself for, too, because, you know, I know I've built an audience around criticizing race conscious ideas, criticizing mm -hmm. woke race ideas. And, uh, you know, so I make a conscious effort whenever I disagree with people in my camp to try to flag that and, and to say it because um, I think it's something you have to make a conscious effort to do or else mm -hmm. you'll just never do it. So for instance, Biden saying that he, uh, his Supreme court nominee is going to be a black woman, right? Like this is the kind of thing you'd expect me to be against as someone who has, has uh, you know, made an image, you know, subconscious not not intentionally but who has built an audience around being against things like affirmative action being against mm -hmm. judging people by their race rather than as individuals and yet you know i found that i'm actually not against what what biden did and i tweeted about that because i thought it was this is a good opportunity to give some give my audience an opinion that they don't expect of me and to explain my reasons for it um, even if it doesn't get as much engagement as as it would have if I had been, you know, criticizing what, what right. Biden did. And, you know, just to, just to go into that for a second, so I don't leave people hanging. Sure. Why I'm not, why I'm not against Biden saying his <clears throat> Supreme court nominee is going to be a black woman is, is because I don't think that the process for selecting a Supreme court nominee has ever been meritocratic. Mm -hmm. It's, it's always been, and, probably always will be a backroom deal made in the DC politics style based on who's friends with who, who owes who a favor, who's been waiting, quote unquote, their turn, um, who engages in the right kind of flattery. Um, and can, can, can I, can I jump in? John Shate just sure. wrote an article basically backing what you're saying. It, oh, this is that is, right? Yeah. Think what you will of it. It's not new, but yeah, please. Continue. Right. So it's not as if like there's, you know, once you get to the pool of candidates, obviously there's meritocracy involved in becoming a judge of that level where you're being considered for the Supreme Court. Once you have that pool, 
the president is not able to tell sort of who's more qualified amongst the the already cold pool of candidates. Biden, there's no way Biden can look at the legal dissertations of all these people and come up with the very best, right? He's no. making this decision <laughs> DC politics style, which is yep. grow, you know, it's dirty. It's how the sausage is made. It's based on who who's friends with who, what's advantageous. It's not a meritocracy. Mm-hmm. It never has been. So it doesn't upset me that he's making it openly non-meritocratic where it's always been and always sort of would have been a secret non-meritocratic process. Compare Mm -hmm. that to something like affirmative action. It could easily be a meritocracy. Just stop discriminating against students based on their race. And some schools are far more meritocratic than others. Stop keeping your numbers of Asians low. Stop having like an Asian quota. Mm -hmm. Um, it really could be a meritocratic process. So it upsets me that it's not. Whereas a Supreme Court pick at that level never will be. So, you know, so that's, an you know, point is that's an opportunity for me to say something my my audience probably wouldn't find more popular than the opposite point of view. And I try to take those moments and, and and seize them. Yeah. Well, and personally, I think that's a sign of health. Um, You know, if we were in a 12 step program, uh, we would say step one is admitting you have a problem, right? <laughs> and I'm not saying you have a problem. I'm saying all of us who exist in the media space, and that is, you know, media space as defined as broadly as you possibly can. I mean, defined broadly enough that I'm in it, even though I'm just some jackass with a substack. Um, all of us in the media space have to acknowledge that we have a problem that is so real that it has a name, audience capture. Uh, for those who don't know, you know, that's when you figure out what your audience wants and you just give it to them over and over and over. And we all know this happens. We can all think of our best examples of that happening. Like I said, the second I saw that Eminem thing, I thought this is showing up on Gutfeld. And of course I was right. That's a, it's a, it's a real pressure. And if you can at least know that it's a pressure, that helps. And if you can be honest, honest with your audience, I, I I've written a couple columns where I'm trying to be audit honest with my audience about the pressures I'm feeling just so they at least know. So they, you know, they know where I'm coming from and they know what, what my perspective is. And if, you know, I do have, you know, bias in what I'm writing. And I think it would be ri- ridiculous to argue that you have no bias in your writing. What, what the hell would that look like? They, my audience can get a sense of what that bias is. If you're at least aware of that, if you're at least trying, and, and I think this, probably has to do with not just being a person who works in media, but a person, if you're just trying to be a good thinker, a person who's, you know, figuring out the world, then the path to that is almost certainly not going to be, let me figure out whatever everyone around me is thinking and let me then mimic that because that is good for my safety. You want a rational process that's going to lead you where it leads you. You know, I, uh, I saw your rap, by the way, this is, I should point out, this is the first time I've been interviewed by a uh, public intellectual who's also a rapper. That doesn't happen a lot. <laughs> but I, I, I remember in the, in the second verse, you, it's sort of like objecting to the idea that you're not allowed to think, objecting to the idea that you're not allowed to let your brain go where it's going to go. I mean, I think that really... I think people get that. I feel like I certainly feel it. I think a lot of people are going to respond to that because it is constricting when you're not allowed to let your brain go where it goes, not allowed to go where reason takes you. But of course, if you are going where reason takes you, then sometimes you are going to go to places that maybe, maybe not many people are with you, including possibly your audience. So yeah, if you're never, ever, ever pissing anyone off in your audience, then I would, I would guess you're probably doing something wrong. Yeah. Well, on that note, this has been a really good conversation. Um, your Substack is called I Might Be Wrong. I highly recommend people subscribe. Uh, Jeffrey Maurer. Maurer like That's flower, right. right? Maurer like flower. And the Substack is, is free. So if you're not, if you're like, I'm not sold on this clown, it's free. Go, go read it. And <laughs> if nice. you want to pay me, that's fantastic. And you have a Twitter handle or a website? Uh, yeah, at Jeff might be wrong. It's just a B, not the word B-E, because that would be too many characters. So at Jeff might be wrong on Twitter. But really, most of my stuff is on my sub stack. That's the, uh, that's the place to go. All right, Jeff, thanks so much. Thank you very much for having me. 
If you appreciate the work I do, the best ways to support me are to subscribe directly through my website, colemanhughes.org, and to subscribe to my YouTube channel so you'll never miss my new content. As always, thanks for your support.